Welcome to this second panel of this very interesting day here in Constanza. The second uh, panel with uh, very interesting uh, panelists and the subject, the most provocative of the day, Constanza and the Black Sea, an energy hub for Europe. I think all of you know that Constanza in the next 20 years will be probably the m most important city of Romania. And we are talking here not only about a nuclear county with a nuclear plant in Cernavoda, not only a county that will uh, develop more the US military base in Kogalnichanu and uh, with a strong investment from US Department of Defense and uh, the perspective for this uh, county and for uh, this city is uh, absolutely brilliant from my point of view and we will try to find from our excellent panelists what are <coughs> what uh, is their vision about this very generous subject constanza and the black sea an energy hub for europe and uh, i will ask uh, First of all, Razvan Nicolescu, who is executive lead advisor on energy and resources for Deloitte. What is his vision about energy hub for a city and a county like Constanza? Razvan Nicolescu. Thank you very much uh, uh, for the question for, and for the invitation. Uh, yes, I fully agree with you, Radu. It's a very provocative. Uh, it's a very pro provocative topic. Um, Black Sea, from my point of view, is an interesting area. Um, I mean, uh, in terms of oil and gas, uh, we are at the beginning of the exploration activities. Uh, several uh, wells have been drilled uh, in Romania, few other wells in other countries, but we are at the beginning. Uh, so the future uh, could uh, provide uh, very nice surprises. I remember that uh, in the case of uh, 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 North Sea, they drilled uh, 40 wells and it was nothing at the beginning. Um, we were uh, luckier uh, here in the Black Sea, at, uh, especially in Romania, the first well drilled uh, uh, deep offshore was uh, a successful one. Uh, so, as I said, we are at the beginning, but uh, Black Sea could uh, definitely become um, a region or a place uh, very uh, good in terms of providing uh, uh, energy security, providing resources. Um, there are also interesting uh, infrastructure projects uh, in the region. Uh, it is uh, the project, the gas pipeline Brua. It is also the other one under construction, the Turkish, uh, the Turkish uh, pipeline. Uh, because if we uh, want to have this part of the world, the hub, what we need is to have uh, uh, infrastructure projects built. Without uh, uh, pipelines, uh, it's difficult to be a hub. So there are uh, pipelines in, under construction. Uh, it's also interesting uh, in terms of geopolitics, because we have a number of countries, um, I mean, that have uh, different uh, ways of doing business. Let's put it like that. So we have uh, two EU countries, Romania and Bulgaria. Um, we have uh, Turkey, uh, the Ukraine, uh, Georgia, um, countries that have a legislation uh, closer uh, to the legislation of the European Union, countries that are observers or members of the Energy Community Treaty. Uh, we also have uh, Russian Federation with their uh, own model, I mean, with the very big uh, companies, Rosneft, uh, Gazprom, with the state uh, very involved in the energy business. So it's very, also very interesting uh, in terms of the political, uh, the political dialogue. We also have a, uh, an organization, the Organization for the Cooperation, I think it's co called for of the Black Sea Countries or something like that that probably should uh, try to do more in terms of the cooperation uh, in the energy field. We don't have here uh, uh, a framework uh, that does exist, for example, in the North Sea. Um, what's happened if there is an accident, for example? Do we have a, a phone to, uh, to access? How do we work together? 
uh, how can we manage uh, spill uh, uh, response uh, if there is a uh, oil leakage uh, um, so as you said it's very interesting romania has been uh, has been uh, progressing uh, i mentioned about gas uh, but it's also in terms of renewable energy the largest uh, uh, onshore wind projects um, in Europe are built close to the Black Sea coast. Um, in Navodar, uh, it will be soon built uh, a new uh, gas cogeneration power plant. Um, the petrochemical business could uh, be, uh, uh, I mean, could be, let's say, relaunched, if I can put it like that, because we used to produce petrochemicals in the past. Um, and things have been happening not only in Romania, but also in Turkey, but also in Bulgaria. I think, Mehmet, about Turkey, I, I let you talk. Uh, uh, I'm not, uh, for the moment, I'm not going to, to comment too much, but I know that there are many things happening uh, there. So it's, it's interesting, and uh, I think it's, for Constanza, it's very good. Investments, millions, new jobs, taxes paid, so... We expect to see uh, more beautiful... We are talking about billions, not millions. Billions. Billions to come through Constanza. And that's why we uh, uh, said for this panel that Constanza and the Black Sea could be a hub for Europe because we can understand and we can see that billions are coming from the Black Sea through Constanza <laughs> about the... the, the, the uh, gas resources that Razvan Nicolescu told us. We have a refinery. I told you we have a nuclear plant. The highway to capital Bucharest is functioning. Uh, so we have all the infrastructure together with the, the Constanza shipyard to ask uh, very good specialists like Mehmet Ogutku, the founder, executive chair of Bosphorus Energy Club. What should we do, Mehmet? with all those billions that are coming to us. Where are the billions? <laughs> In the Black Sea. <laughs> well, I think we shouldn't be that optimistic. Yes, there are not only billions, trillions in the international finance market available for uh, viable projects. But uh, whether they will come or not is another question, because I think this is what we need to discuss as well, how to attract these billions uh, to countries like Romania and cities like uh, Constanta here. Um, but before I think I answer your question, it will be important to understand uh, the broader context. Because if you don't understand uh, the game-changing dynamics in world energy and uh, investments and geopolitics, and also regionally what's happening, it's difficult to put Constanta and Romania into this picture. In that sense, uh, I think uh, we shouldn't be that optimistic about the huge infrastructure investments to be uh, considered and uh, constructed uh, as we want, because the game has changed in this sense. If you look at the energy picture today, it's considerably different than what we had, let's say, five years ago. Things are uh, evolving rapidly, because we used to say, when I used to work in uh, International Energy Agency, that you know, and the energy industry needs long lead time. You, know, you invest today and the results will be coming in 10 years, 15 years. It's no longer so. I mean, look at the shale gas situation in the US. Who would know that shale gas was going to become a star uh, of the world natural gas industry? And also, who would know that ISMAT was going to emerge as a new gas basin from uh, Tamar, Leviathan, Aphrodite, and uh, uh, Zor, Nur in Egypt, so huge natural gas base was discovered. Again, they are also struggling with the question of how to invest in the infrastructure, how to bring investors so that this gas will be extracted after we establish that there is gas, and then find the most lucrative markets to which you can connect. So it's not an easy job. I mean, yes, Black Sea, uh, we taught that for decades, it may be Another North Sea that we saw uh, in the UK, Netherlands, Norway, and, but it failed to fulfill our expectations, except in Romania, because we see that there are new discoveries in Romania, offshore Black Sea. Turkey failed to find 
uh, much hoped gas in East uh, Black Sea region. Ukraine, because of difficulties, you know, ExxonMobil is pulling out. Uh, the geopolitics are becoming uh, uh, obstructive force to reckon with in that region. And also, infrastructure investment requires, you know, very intense capital commitment. And it takes long lead times, really. And once it matures, its lifetime is 60, 70 years sometimes. And in Europe, if you look around, especially for gas infrastructure, there is really a fatigue for building new pipelines. And uh, so if I always say that they try to take the decision today for TANAP or TAP, you know, bringing Azeri Shahdeniz to gas to Turkey and to Europe, I don't think that investors will put money behind that. So here, again, another uh, message. Timing is very important. <coughs> when you launch the project, whether it fits into the requirements of the day, and also it is aligned with the uh, trends in the future. Because we are going to a, through a transition period uh, in energy uh, worldwide, but also particularly in Europe, more and more moving towards decarbonization or low carbon energy economy. And so natural gas will be abundant in certain parts of Europe. Although demand is increasing, we think that by 2030, there will be an additional demand of about, I think, 6 to 70 BCM of gas. This is nothing. Russia can produce this in one year <coughs> in terms of the reserves. So gas is there. But the demand for gas will not be increasing as much as we think it will. And we invested almost $3 trillion since 2004 in renewable energy, wind, photovoltaic uh, power, solar, uh, geothermal, and hydro. And there will be less and less investment in fossil fuels. And the European Union, the widespread feeling is that post-2020, there will be very minimal investment on fossil fuels. So we have to bear in mind also this fact that the decarbonization will be very important in future decisions. Then technologies are developing so fast I mean, the cost of uh, producing uh, wind energy you know, in Turkey were providing subsidy of about, I think, uh, almost 13 uh, uh, euro, uh, 13 cents per kilowatt hour for 10 years. Now, uh, the cost is coming down to 3, 4 cents. <coughs> and there is not going to be further support coming from government. And how sustainable it will be, we shall see. The projects that already started, they are lucky, but the new projects and will be quite risky. The investors, the bankers will be worried about it. And so I think the technological advances, and which will bring, of course, electrical cars to the forefront and bring the cost considerably down in uh, production and uh, will affect the way we take our decisions on energy projects as well as the infrastructure that will uh, carry them. The other uh, important uh, issue is the price volatility. At the end of the day, what consumers are interested, be it government, industry, or household consumers, the price. Yes. For us, decarbonization is important, geopolitics are important, whether you get it from Russia or you get it from Eastmed or Caspian or Black Sea, yes, these are important. But for the end users at the end of the day, the pricing and the effect on competitiveness is so important. So if now uh, I was in a, a meeting on Eastmed last week, and there, there was a huge discussion about what will happen to, you know, exclusive economic zones, geopolitical tension between Turkey and Israel, Cyprus and uh, Lebanon, Hezbollah, Israel. All these issues are fine. But at the end of the day, even if you don't have all this geopolitical tension, <coughs> the cost of extraction and putting into the market of the gas in that region will not make sense because timing is wrong. 2019, you will have Turk Stream at the end of 2019. Turk Stream, one, probably two, will be coming to Turkey and bringing a substantial amount of almost uh, 32, 33 BCM of gas. And then Shahdeniz gas, two, will be coming to Turkey, 16. 
uh, six for Turkish market, ten for Southeast Europe. Then EastMed, there is this, uh, I think, pipeline dream that the uh, Israeli Cypriot uh, gas might be joined and put into the pipeline over Crete through Greece to Europe. And uh, it's a huge cost. I don't think anybody will underwrite that. But there is a hope there. And uh, beyond Caspian, there are other producers like Turkmenistan, which have not come into picture. They have the fourth largest reserve uh, in the world in terms of natural gas. But because of the Russian and Iranian obstruction, they cannot cross the Caspian. Only way you can send this gas across Caspian is through perhaps as an email attachment and under the current geopolitical conditions. Therefore, uh, I think you have to bear in mind serious constraints, because it's good to be uh, aiming for uh, uh, being a regional hub. And uh, I think that's an admirable goal. And many countries are doing the same thing. When you go to Bulgaria, they want to become a hub. Greece would like to become a hub. Or Turkey wants to be a hub. Hungary, Georgia, Hungary, Hungary, wherever you go. So uh, in my opinion, there are a couple of criteria where you can qualify for becoming a hub. First, you have to have sufficient production. I think in that regard, uh, Poland, uh, uh, Romania passes the uh, threshold because you are self-sufficient almost in gas and oil, traditionally also been there. And you could also bring some transit gas through Romania. So you have the gas uh, base for that. Second is the physical infrastructure and uh, building pipelines, ports, and pumping stations, and what you have. This requires enormous amount of capital, and also trust needed. I need to know that when I build this infrastructure, spending billions of dollars, on the other side of the pipeline, they will require it. Because there is a huge possibility that you build a pipeline, and it will remain idle. Look at Spain, and huge LNG. Uh, capacity they generated, they only use 30% of that. 70% of LNG capacity in Spain is not used. And Turkish-Russian pipelines, you know, we have this Turk stream coming, but what about the blue stream that they built already? It's also underutilized in many ways. And plus, not building any new infrastructure, but you need to upgrade the existing one. And one of the reasons why Russians didn't want the Ukrainian uh, pipeline system is beyond the political considerations and dispute, is also it is fast aging. It needs to be upgraded. This will require huge investment. Rather than doing this, doing Nord Stream 2 is much better for Russians. So, uh, so you have to see this infrastructure fatigue as well. So it's not easy to convince the bank. I mean, you can decide as government, or you can have wonderful blueprints, visions, but unless it's underwritten by the financiers and the bankers, it's not going to happen. We saw this with Nabucco. More than 10 years we talk about it. And then when the stars were aligned and TANAP pipeline was built like this quite quickly because it made sense commercially at that time. And also I think uh, I like the uh, Schumpeter's uh, phrase that small is beautiful. Don't always think of huge big projects, billions of dollars. Sometimes you need to start in small steps, small practical steps. We are very good for small steps, you can count on us. Well, I think this success breeds success. So because big projects, big strategic uh, openings, they are good. It makes good sense, quite sexy. But on the other hand, uh, when you achieve small projects, small steps, and then it leads to bigger, medium-sized steps, and then the bigger steps. <laughs> That's also my experience in the energy world, wherever uh, uh, I went to. And uh, also, I like uh, someone in the previous session said that, you know, the 19th century was the century of empires, then 20th century, the century of uh, nation states, and this century is the century of cities. And it's true. And so we have to give more focus on places like here, Constanta, rather than talking about Romania. Cities make sense, or Istanbul, or Berlin, or Lisbon. And uh, also, I think, human touch, connectivity, not only through infrastructure investments, uh, bringing air, uh, rail, or highways, but human connectivity also makes a big difference. If the mayor is an impressive figure, 
as he does, you know, takes the plane and flies to Istanbul and then Sofia and then uh, Budapest and Brussels as he's doing, also the best practices he's trying to collect. I think this makes a huge difference. I don't think the mayor is only a facilitator and integrator, as he said. And I like uh, his uh, definition of uh, how he sees his role. But he's also a leader, not coordinator. He's a leader. He has to lead. It makes a huge difference. You know, when somebody believes in what he's doing and leading it to the end, it inspires people, motivates, and it also encourages investors to come when they see that there is a strong will here and people are following it through. And also, uh, our friend uh, from CNN, uh, he talked about the US, you know, Google being one of the, uh, Stanford University being one of the uh, major investors there, and Israel startups. When you fail, so that's a success for the next step. I think these are very important messages. Here, uh, I think uh, this city and Romania uh, has greater opportunity to become a hub for technological startups because you have the human capital. You have the connection with the rest of the world. And it will have uh, implications. It will have ramifications for the energy industry. When you talk about energy, it's not only you know, oil, gas, petrochemicals, nuclear, renewables, and the energy is in every part of our life. So if you energize societies, and it will have indirect effect on how uh, you develop your uh, energy industry, become a hub. Chinese, I want to say also that they are a new factor to reckon with in this geography, thanks to this uh, uh, Belt and Road Initiative, uh, which links 85 countries, and it involves about uh, $850 billion of investment in energy infrastructure and connectivity per year. I don't think we have seen anything like this in our history. Even the Marshall Aid, after the Second World War, involved uh, 16 times less than what Chinese are offering today. Whether they will be able to manage it, because I don't think Chinese have any uh, experience of managing such uh, cross-country uh, giant projects because it involves political sensitivities, social issues, and uh, risk, and what you have. They haven't dealt with these issues in the past, but they are learning fast, I guess. But it's a game changer. So if also Constanta uh, could become uh, one of the hubs through which Chinese enter into the European markets, it's not going to be the only one. As you know, the Chinese always work with options, and it takes ages to bring them to any real decision, they can promise the world for you, and lots of MOUs, agreements, protocols, but uh, the challenges to bring the real value to the uh, country, I think it will be uh, one of the more beneficial sites, because you have to uh, engage as much as possible regionally and internationally. But also there is a fatigue. I mean, there is so, much, so many organizations, IFIs, you know, regional organization, Black Sea Corporation, Energy Charter, uh, energy community, uh, so European Union, World Bank, IFC. So there is a web of so many organizations involved. At the end of the day, not much comes out of it. Here, I think, again, smart leadership identifies what really matters, rather than uh, wasting energy on so many different activities, initiatives, be more focused, sharply, and uh, trying to generate results, because uh, also, our friend Mircea said something in his talk. He said, uh, we have to have delivery teams. I like this expression because delivery is what matters. We all look to countries, companies, regions, cities on the basis of what they deliver rather than what they talk about. And so there's more to talk about, but you gave me, thank you, for three hours. But I'll stop here and then perhaps question and answer later. Thank you, Mehmet. We were so optimistic before Mehmet's speech. <laughs> right now that we came down to earth, uh, we need uh, a more uh, optimistic approach from uh, Nikolai Havrilets, who is an advisor of Minister of Energy. And I was discussing with uh, Razvan Nicolescu before this panel started that uh, we have uh, two investments already 
here in Constanza in the Black Sea region. One of the best players in the world, Exxon, has started with one billion euro project for the gas resources. And the other one is wind energy, which Razvan Nicolescu told me that is the biggest wind energy onshore investments in the e Eastern Europe. Yeah. In Europe. In Europe. In Europe. Here in Constanza. So one billion euro in wind energy investment, one billion euro Exxon on the gas, then other billions should come. And there are certain proofs that here a business and an investment could give good returns. Isn't it, Nikolai Havrilets? Yes. <coughs> Thank you very much for your invitation uh, in the new position, being uh, a personal advisor of, uh, to the Ministry of Energy. I uh, acted on uh, full mandate as uh, President of regulator, National Regulatory for Energy. Uh, that is an exception in uh, Romania. Uh, and uh, to have an uh, optimistic approach, uh, I have to, to add that uh, in the 17th century, there was uh, a seven cities uh, policy. I'm, I came from this area, Siebenbürgen in Germany. Transylvania was called a seven city uh, country. Uh, I am... Um, I am speaking about this uh, seven cities because uh, country side because in this uh, countryside uh, the most important uh, natural gas reservoir was uh, uh, was uh, uh, put it in production and Romania benefited uh, from this area. Uh, now the new area for gas and if we, you don't mind, there will be one city. Uh, uh, country that will uh, benefit from the new uh, natural gas reservoir that uh, for sure you know uh, in it's, it's uh, explorated in or will be explorated in uh, Black Sea. Uh, this area, Constance, it's a blessed area for energy industry because uh, we have most important investments in renewables, 1.1 billion euro in uh, wind, uh, and uh, yesterday uh, one of these uh, investors uh, has launched uh, a battery for uh, uh, energy storage. That is uh, a moment that uh, Romania uh, has noticed yesterday for, for at first. So we can say about the uh, three uh, international transit pipelines for uh, uh, supply in the Balkans. But as you see, as you say, uh, uh, Turkey market for gas it's plenty. Romanian gas uh, for Romanian gas no no more place in Turkey or in Balkans. That's why I can say that will be new huge investments and opportunities in Constanza to use directly gas in uh, petrochemicals and fertilizers and uh, power plants. They can use uh, natural gas uh, uh, obtained from new reservoir without transmission cost, without distribution cost, and they can use uh, facilities of uh, Port Constanza in order to export this a uh, new uh, product with uh, 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 with new value. They can add value for this natural gas, not uh, to sell directly gas in, into, I don't know, in which part of Europe, because uh, the TANAP, it's almost uh, put it in force. Uh, we will discuss about the uh, Revitusa LNG uh, possibility to supply the Brua pipeline uh, and uh, for sure in the Nord Stream will uh, continue the, this, uh, this uh, development. So uh, nothing much more simple to do that use the, this possibility in Romania in, in, and add value. But for this one uh, situation, Romania has to, to, to impose the predictable, stable legislation. 
uh, both in primary legislation and secondary legislation. As president of a uh, regulatory body, uh, I have uh, approved the uh, development of two treatment gas plant in uh, the near Constance, one in Tuzla, another one in Vadu, that uh, are almost uh, approved uh, the financing. The, we can discuss about the 70 uh, million euro and also uh, there will be new investments uh, from transmission operator, Transgas, uh, for two new pipeline of uh, 30 kilometers each one and 250 kilometers directly to Podishoru when the uh, Black Sea Reservoir will be, uh, uh, will be uni unified with the national transmission system. So in Constance, there are uh, opportunities for huge investments in various, various uh, uh, industrial activity, uh, having uh, natural gas as uh, principal support. So I can see a uh, very nice development in energy and petrochemicals and power plants in, in this area. Having in consideration that in this moment, 30% of general electrical uh, demand is assured by the, this side of Romania. We are speaking about 17% uh, coming from the nu nuclear power plants from Chernavoda and 11% coming from wind uh, established in the Dobruja area. So very nice perspective, but we have to to act with uh, very clever uh, legislation in order to, to impose win-win principle. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nicola Herres. Yes, more optimistic, Mehmet. I think I just want to say something about uh, this approach. Rather than producing the gas and then processing it and sending through the transmission lines to end markets, it's a huge effort. And if there is a mark if there is no market there, it's wasted opportunity. What you are saying makes sense. I think this is exactly what Iran has done, but under different conditions. They are the second largest reserve holder of gas in the world, and they only export to Turkey about 10 BCM. They had huge plans to uh, build pipelines to Pakistan, India, and elsewhere. It didn't work. And what they are doing right now, they don't even uh, send as LNG to the world markets. And what they do is focus so much on petrochemical industry gas-fired power generation and uh, gasification of their own economy in transportation in other areas, households. And this way, creating added value. This is what matters. How you generate the added value, <coughs> better value from their resources. I mean, I was also for some time in Turkey against the idea of all these pipelines crisscrossing the country, you know, east to west, north to south, and what benefit it brings to you if you are not the producing country as a transit country, pay, uh, getting only the fees, but the adverse impacts are much more than that. <coughs> Therefore, I don't think that we have to have, we should have fixed ideas about you know, being a hub, getting the gas, oil, whatever, and then sending to other countries. The key criteria here is what added value it generates for our country, our prosperity, our traders, our investors, our household, uh, compute, uh, household uh, consumers. And therefore, uh, I think if we adopt this approach, if the conditions change, of course, you could adapt your strategy accordingly. And I don't think we should put so much uh, effort into building huge infrastructure. Of course, there are some basic infrastructure that we need for the roads or some of the uh, domestic trunk lines to be built, connected to the neighboring countries because they're already uh, interconnectors between Bulgaria and uh, uh, Greece and then Romania could be linked to this and Hungary. These are important links. But for uh, very ambitious big projects, uh, even the big European countries are slowing down on that. They are uh, reconsidering their infrastructure projects. Now the share of infrastructure in the EU budget came down to about 1.4 or 5, I think, from 2. Six in the past. So uh, it is important to develop our strategies in line of the realities on the ground, what others are doing, what are the conditions, because 
there are factors beyond our control and influence. <coughs> Thank you, Mehmet. Uh, very interesting discussion. Uh, we already touched all the perspective of uh, doing very good business here in Constanza and the Black Sea. Gas, wind energy, nuclear. So any time a major player from around the world could be here to invest or to modernize or to upgrade all of these investments that already, uh, already attracted billions. So for this Romanian market, or for a regional market like Mehmet said, Constanza is really something uh, very reliable on, Razvan. Definitely. Uh, just want to add uh, one figure. Uh, together with my colleagues from Deloitte, we calculated uh, recently using uh, a model uh, very well known at the international level. It's called the input-output model. Uh, a model that was uh, developed by um, um, an American uh, guy who got the Nobel Prize for it. Uh, so we used that model uh, in order to estimate the revenues to the Romanian state budget coming from uh, the oil and gas uh, activities in the Black Sea from now until 2040. And uh, the figure is a minimum 30 billion US dollars coming from direct and indirect taxes um, from now until 2040. So minimum 30 billion uh, US dollars. The, the study has been, uh, has been uh, published uh, recently. <laughs> Um, but Black Sea is larger than uh, uh, larger than Romania, and um, as it was uh, said before, there are many things happening, uh, and there is this uh, technological uh, development. Um, today in Deloitte, uh, we have more uh, IT people than uh, accountants in Romania. Um, so we talk a lot about uh, de demand response. We talk a, lo a lot about, uh, um, I, uh, I know that Constanza have a clever mayor, but uh, you know, before he mentioned some of uh, uh, his plans, um, which were part of uh, a smart city concept. So we talk about smart cities, we talk about uh, demand response, we, uh, we talk about uh, small uh, individual uh, energy producers. So today, uh, if you want to install uh, in Constanza um, a PV uh, installation to have your, uh, to produce your uh, own hot water, the cost is, for a family with four members, the cost is below 200 US dollar. So you invest 200 US dollar and you have you produce your own uh, uh, hot water during the summertime, so for almost five months. Uh, so things have been changing, and I fully agree that there are two, uh, the international level, there are two major drivers. One is the fight against climate change. So this is the fact. Even if there are some, still some politicians that don't believe in it. It's a fact, and it's probably the biggest threat faced by uh, humanity uh, in, uh, in our time, and we have to act collectively. So this will have an impact on the energy sector. And the second impact is related to technology, is related to digitalization. So things have been happening very rapidly. I spent one month uh, during uh, this summer in California I had a very interesting discussion with uh, Elon Musk. So what they have been doing in California has nothing to do with what is discussed in, uh, in Washington. It's another planet. In, an, in Washington, this is, they have been changing the world, actually. Um, so technology, digitalization, climate change will definitely have a huge impact on, uh, on, uh, on energy. And on top of this, uh, it will probably be a competition for clients as it was said before. Um, I think that the era of a strong OPEC uh, making uh, very, very important decisions uh, will end soon. 
because of the LNG gas, because of renewable, because of the gas that is now sold uh, without any uh, link to the uh, oil prices, things have been changing also from the geopolitical perspective. Thank you, Razvan Nicolas. Do you want something? Just a conclusion. Yes, I think uh, I should mention something about Turkey-Romanian uh, connection as well. I mean, Turkey, from whichever angle you look at it, is a growth economy, about close to one trillion dollar uh, GDP size, and heavily dependent on imported energy. We import 98 percent of our natural gas, and 93 percent of our oil, and 50 percent of our coal, and it goes on like this. So for us in Turkey, energy is not just a commodity, it's a national security matter. Therefore, when you make decisions on energy, it's not based only on commercial realities. If I'm the Minister of Energy in Turkey, I would certainly uh, promote greater linkage with Romania, a friendly country, close to Istanbul, you know, the uh, air distance is about 380 uh, kilometers, uh, less than 40 minutes, because we are already importing from Iran, not so reliable uh, supplier to us. We have lots of arbitration cases going. And we heavily depend on Russia. It's almost 53, 54% of our gas coming from Russia. Now, of course, we have a marriage of convenience uh, with Moscow, but you never know what might happen. In the past, we had a Russian plane blown up in the air, and then relations got worse. So, therefore, if you are a smart leader, you have to have balanced relationship and flows. So Romania will provide the Western link. You know, we have already links with uh, Iran, Russia, Azerbaijan, perhaps, perhaps Kurdish region of Iraq, where I'm also active uh, somehow, and we wanted to have some gas there. Then Ismet gas, I don't think it will ever find its way to Turkey in the near future. But Romanian gas, although uh, rightly so, you said Turkey is already flush with gas. You, they don't need any additional supply. But for political reasons, if they also uh, economics could justify it somehow. Some limited amount of gas could come from Romania. Then uh, your uh, renewable production here on the Black Sea coast, offshore and onshore, and it could also find its way somehow because pipelines versus cables is the new slogan as well. And in Iran, there was a project uh, we were involved. So rather than selling gas to Turkey, they said on the Turkish border, we built gas-fired power plants and sell electricity through the cables rather than pipelines. And this will also avoid the sanctions regime and what you have. Therefore, you have to think a bit creatively. But I believe uh, that there is a future in terms of electricity interconnectivity between Turkey and Romania. This way, there will be also reverse flows in times of crisis, uh, supply security considerations. So Romania could be quite useful for Turkey and vice versa. Okay, I want to thank all the panelists. I think uh, it was uh, a very good discussion. Uh, we have to end here and then uh, go to lunch because in 40 minutes we'll have a brilliant, I know it will be a brilliant discussion with Sam Burke from CNN, with Mircea Joana and the Turkish Ambassador Ertash. Then we'll see you back here in 40 minutes. Thank you. <laughs>